All right, so, wow. <laughs> wow. This is like a huge turnout for something like this. I really appreciate all of you coming. Uh, I'm honored to be chatting in front of you guys and sharing some of my experience over the years. Um, a lot of distinguished audiophiles um, in the audience. Uh, a lot of you know things that I don't know, and I'm looking forward to learning from you as I also try to communicate with you stuff that I've picked up that might be helpful in what uh, is ahead of you in your audiophile journey. So, um, based on the sign-up uh, uh, level and everybody who showed up, um, it's clear that streaming is something that's on everybody's mind. It's not something that's terribly new, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, first of all, can you guys hear me in the back? Am I loud enough? Not at all? All right. Uh, sorry about that. So, super excited to be chatting with you guys about uh, some of my experience in the streaming space. It's becoming an interesting topic. It's been around, like I say, for a long time. What um, what's new and why we should why we're talking about it here in 2020 when we weren't talking about it say in uh as much in you know four or five years ago uh, is that it's finally gotten to the place where it's good enough for sort of fussy listeners like us to enjoy what we're hearing uh, it's been convenient a lot all the kids are doing it it's stuff that you can play in your car now you can play while you're jogging you can play on your little uh, smart speaker throughout the house. You can get some music on the patio and it's satisfactory for that kind of stuff. And that's been the case for a while. But um, for it to sort of, you know, pass into that sort of shrouded special space that we have um, in our audio systems where we've done all that we can to get the noise floor as low as we possibly can, that we've done what we can to control the room and how it responds to sound. Um, some of us have gone to um, incredible lengths to get the power system done right. Um, everything just right so that our analog system can sound good and all those things have benefits. Um, putting digital in there just seems dirty, right? It's just, especially for streaming, right? It's just not something that we do. Um, and it hasn't really kind of been worthy of that, I think, in a lot of our experience um, <coughs> until very recently. And I know for some of you, you've tried, I'll rewind a little bit. A lot of us, you know, when we, the CD was introduced back in the 80s, we said, oh cool, this is nice, we'll give this a try. And a lot of us were burned by that experience, right? The CD was supposed to be this amazing thing that's way better than anything that we'd heard up to that point. And it was different, but a lot of us weren't so impressed um, with it as far as it being better. Um, in a lot of cases, we've kind of walked away from digital. Um, and then when streaming comes along, you're like, okay, here we go again. So, you know, this is another thing that's going to be kind of mediocre and the kids will try it out and it's convenient, sure. And, but sacrificing uh, convenience on the altar of quality the other way around anyway. Is, is not great, right? It's not what we want to do um, for our primary listening system. So it'll be fine in the bathroom or the bedroom or the patio, but it's not something that we want in our list room. So now we're finally getting to the place where, um, where it can be satisfying in that space. So uh, with that introduction, I'm going to, so the first thing I'm going to do is, I've been to a lot of these talks before on different topics. And one of the things that I find frustrating is like the guy who's doing the talk, guy or gal, will kind of do this sort of long, um, introduction and sales presentation or whatever. And the nugget that you're trying to get is buried all the way at the end. And by the time you get there, you're exhausted. You've lost focus, lost attention. Um, I don't want to do that to you guys. So what I'm going to try to do, and you can keep me honest and interrupt me if I don't, is give you kind of what you need uh, to know up front. So if you fall asleep during the rest of it or you have to leave or whatever, um, you'll have uh, the nuggets that you need to kind of get started now. There's gonna be a lot of forward references, so some of the stuff might not make a huge amount of sense if you're not experienced in the space. If you are, then it'll make all the sense in the world, I hope. But, um, so stick around to kind of see those details fleshed out. But uh, I wanna to try to give you kind of the, the, the quick and dirty uh, explanation up front. Um, first of all, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this more later, um, pg and is happy with us because we've got a lot of big iron here that's drawing some current. Um, and then there's this mess of things uh, on this table here. I promise that in a typical streaming environment, um, it doesn't look this horrible, or I hope not anyway. Um, normally these components that you see here are scattered throughout a, a residence by you know, quite a fair distance. Um, this is what it looks like when you sort of gather all that stuff and cram it onto one little table. Um, but I'll talk in a little bit more detail and even during the breaks about some of that stuff if you've got questions about it. All right, here we go. Uh, did that work? All right, we are, we are good. So here are the essentials. Here are the essentials of five foot dollar streaming. Now I'm going to talk about what streaming is and some of the history and all that stuff. I promise those are detail things. Yeah, yeah. Quick question. Will you be 
providing copies of the slide presentation? Yeah, you'll get copies of this. There's a video being made. Um, there's probably going to be a record tour, some merch. Oh, we're going to have you guys set up with everything you could possibly want. We, with, it's t-shirts. T-shirts, yeah. You just whatever you need. We are going to put. We're going to get the stuff together for you to memorialize our time together because it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope anyway. All right. So one of the things you'll notice when you look at this picture here, there's this giant circle that says network. Um, a lot of us don't have a network in our listening room or maybe even a very mature network in our house. But a long, long time ago, we didn't have electricity either. And now you've got electricity in every room in your house, right? Um, well, some of us, a lot of us do. I mean, it depends on what time of the month and whether PG&E is doing the rolling blackouts or not. But um, uh, I'll try not to pick on them during the whole talk. Um, but, but, you know, now before you to wind up your gramophone or whatever, and you could play some things without electricity, but now you kind of have to have it. For streaming, you got to have a network, and that's kind of central to the whole thing. And how you put that network together matters some or a lot. If you talk to our friend Stephen over here, He's got some stuff that is, is kind of blowing my mind about how kind of deep in the weeds you can get on the networking side um, to kind of elevate that quality even further. But you need to have a robust network to be able to do any of the streaming stuff. The next thing you need to have is a server. Um, now the server doesn't have to be, it's not like a, you know, a giant tower thing or some giant thing that you put in a rack. Today for this event, we're just using this little um, kind of castaway uh, HP Celeron thing that I had lying around to use as a server. Most people these days like to use these smaller desktop PCs as servers. The function that they uh, provide is indexing all of our music for us. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different software that'll take care of this. Um, they may look up and uh, enrich that music with missing metadata, things like that. Um, they will, if it's a nice some piece of software, They'll allow you to interact with them via a smartphone app uh, or a tablet app. So you have remote control. You don't have to like hook up a keyboard and a monitor and, um, and all that kind of stuff to be able to interact with your music. You can just look at it on a tablet and the tablet is getting its information from that little computer, the album art, the whatever other information you're doing um, and allowing you to control playback, play pause, um, skip, search for tracks, put, up, put together playlists. You can do that from a, a tablet instead. But you have to have one of these things kind of somewhere in your house. And uh, now one of the things that we'll cover, and I'll emphasize a lot during this talk, you don't want one of these things in your listening room. So if you were worried that I was gonna tell you, yeah, for streaming, you're gonna need to put a big ass computer in your listening room so that you can do this. And if you're not willing to, then you're left out in the cold. That's not the case. It just needs to be somewhere in your house. Um, mine's in a coat closet because who needs a coat closet in California? Um, <laughs> Uh, but you could put it in an office, you can put it, maybe it's a computer that you use for doing your taxes or whatever, if you don't mind leaving it on, just leave it on. It just needs to be connected to your house someplace. Now, uh, the music server, is, it's gonna be potentially feeding music to a whole bunch of different spots in your house all at once. So uh, you could do it over Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi is getting better all the time. We're, we're looking at you know Wi-Fi 6, that's gigabit plus speeds over Wi-Fi. Um, I'm old fashioned, so I think a wired connection is still probably better. There's fancy glass fiber things that you can do as well, but you want something that's reliable um, just because if there's something flaky, uh, you'll spend a lot of time troubleshooting it. I, I help a lot of people online with these kinds of problems and they can just plug a network cable in then those problems go away and they're happier. So unless you're uh, interested in uh, troubleshooting or getting a, WAN, a, a Wi-Fi analyzer and troubleshooting fiddly Wi-Fi things, just plug a network cable into the thing and forget about it. You'll be a lot happier. Um, right, so you gotta have one of those things. Um, got to have, I talked about this a little before, you've gotta have a remote control. So you probably already have one of these things. Like, um, raise your hand if you don't have a computer in your house. All right, so there we go. And it doesn't need to be super fancy either. Just, you know, Windows, Mac, Linux, whatever. You just need to have one of those things. Gotta have a network to connect to it. Um, you need to have a remote control. So how many people here don't have a cell phone or a tablet? Like, how did you even find this place without a cell phone? <laughs> so, um, so you almost certainly have one of those. If you don't, you know, buy a used tablet or something, um, it can connect up to your Wi-Fi. The, the, the remote can be on Wi-Fi and that's no problem, right? It's, it's uh, in fact, you probably wouldn't want to drag a tablet around with a giant cable connected to it. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, that bit can be on Wi-Fi. Then they need an output device. And this is the thing that you probably don't have. And it's one of the things that we're gonna talk about in a little bit more, more detail. We don't want a computer in our listening room because it's noisy. And we'll talk about noise because noise is complicated. Um, a lot of people say, well, if I put my ear up to this thing, I don't hear any noise. So it must not be making any noise and it's not gonna bother the system. But there's a lot more kinds of noise than just vibrations, than just fan noise. 
Um, and so we don't want uh, any of that kind of extra noise, uh, high frequency noise, ultrasonic noise, radio frequency noise, electromagnetic interference, ground plane contamination, uh, all kinds of things that can sneak into our system when you put an IT component like one of these computers in your listening room. We want something that's super duper quiet and that's designed for audio. Unfortunately, the industry has responded with that need by making some devices. I've got all kind of pretty inexpensive devices here that I think work really well, um, but there are lots and lots of them, more coming out all the time. Essentially what they do is they take a network connection in, Ethernet in, and some kind of audio out. Uh, this particular box is Ethernet in, and that oh, was my cable showing, sorry. Um, this particular box is Ethernet in, and uh, either USB or SPDIF out. So some DACs sound better over SPDIF, uh, some DACs sound better over USB. The difference between this and just like a generic piece of hardware though is that the manufacturer spent a lot of time and a lot of effort to make sure that the, the noise level that this thing emits and the noise that can come out of its uh, digital outputs is as low as possible. They've got something like 30 LDOs, and some people in here know what that is more than me, but it sounds very impressive um, to try to control the noise. Um, they have a linear power supply. There's this big black brick on the floor that's to try to prevent kind of switching power noise getting into the thing. Yeah, go ahead. You and the flag. Allo, Allo. It's a um, Canadian company that is in India, and they're a telecom company. Um, so they had a lot of experience making telecom boards. Telecom boards, it turns out telecom uses a lot of analog to digital and digital to analog conversion. Who knew? Um, the name again? Allo, A-L-L-O. I'll have them, a link to them in the resource in the slides. But um, they, they, since they were busy making all these fancy telecom boards, I guess there was a, a audio file on their board somewhere that was like, hey, we could use some of this uh, fabrication uh, technology that we have to make uh, some equipment for audio files. He probably started it as a hobby and it grew from there. I'm just guessing what, how this thing came about, but it sounds reasonable. Yeah, sure. Uh, I got a little bit lost. The blue box is the network? The, the blue box is the server. The server. The server. And then the network, uh, we'll go into more detail about what network is, but this annoying thing that's flashing green lights in your face, that would be the network. Uh, these are things, the stuff on this corner of the page, you don't want that stuff in your listening room uh, if, you, if you want it to sound great. It should be in a closet or a dungeon or under your steps or in a garage or basement or attic or whatever, yeah. So that server only serves as a streaming distribution point. Doesn't store anything. Doesn't store anything and there's no DAC attached to it. It can't make noise by itself. It, it is not an audio component. It is just a necessary part of infrastructure in our house, in our system, to enable music to go every place else and to enable us to control where that music goes using our tablets or smartphones or whatnot. Yeah? What about audio specific uh, servers? Do we still gonna do that remotely? Yeah, so uh, I mean, audio specific, so that's, uh, we'll get it, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but audio specific servers, it was a thing, right? Um, I know when I first started getting into audio, um, that was the, uh, and there's still some manufacturers who do this kind of stuff. They'll spend an enormous amount of work to make a PC that's otherwise quite noisy as quiet, as low emission as possible. And it's hard to do. It's expensive and it's hard to do. Um, Arender, I think, is a manufacturer that still does this kind of stuff. They make PCs that are like $18,000. Um, they do a very nice job. But if you take a, the, the easiest way to eliminate or prevent noise from getting in your room is to not bring it in there to begin with. Um, so there's a kind of law of physics that says um, that the, the amount of kind of emission from a device that makes noises decreases with kind of the square of the distance or something like that. There's math involved. I mean, other people can help you with the math. Anyway, so if you put this like 50 feet from your listening room, then it'll be quieter from an emissions perspective than a $20,000, you know, dedicated audio PC that's sitting in your component rack, um, just because it's of the proximity, just because of where it is. And then people might argue, well, because these things are still going to make some noise. You can measure it. It's like really, really low. Um, yeah, go ahead. Do you have to hardwire it? So you have to have like a 50 foot cable or? Um, I recommend, like I said, Wi-Fi is a thing. We'll talk about some of the pros and cons of that. I recommend running a dedicated ethernet cable. I've talked to a lot of installers. I had a, a, like an alarm system or security system company install some ethernet cables in my house. Yeah, it was like, I don't know, it was most 200 bucks for a long run throughout my house. It's about, it, take, it takes the same kind of technology as installing an alarm system or installing cable in your house or any other kind of 
low voltage wiring type of thing. And there's a lot of manufacturers in the area that you can call up, even some home theater specialists that do like in wire, in wall speaker wiring, they'll do in wall network cable wiring and it, it doesn't cost very much. Yeah. Uh, and then the device, the black box with the green light on it, that is the output, the output device? Yeah, this box over here is ethernet in and then digital audio out. The box on the corner over there is ethernet in and analog audio out. We're going to talk about that. Let me get to some slides. Otherwise, you guys are going to be here until 7, and my wife's going to be pissed. All right. Good questions, though. So, I, I, And I don't want to encourage you to keep doing that as long as, uh, as long as we don't get thrown out of here. All right. So I talked about this a little bit. Wired Ethernet for these two things here is going to work best. You can do Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is awesome if you have a really good Wi-Fi thing in your house, and your, your neighbors aren't close by competing with it and f filling up the space with even more noisy Wi-Fi, which is not the case for me. You can experiment with it, but your life will be happier if you do this wired thing. I promise you it'll be happier. Um, and if you're like me, I, you know, I work on computers all day long, all week long. When I come home, I want to sit in a listening chair, press play, and listen to music. Not tr get out my Wi-Fi analyzer and figure out what channel I need to move things to so that I can get the shit to work. It'll make me insane, right? So for me, 200 bucks, wired ethernet, never had a problem with it. Never had any packet loss. Um, I've had terabytes of information travel through my network. I look at the counters on my router, zero drop packets, zero retransmits. On the Wi-Fi side, on some days, I have 40% retransmits on Wi-Fi. We'll talk about why that's a problem. Uh, but like, screw that. This is just plug a cable in. It's very good. The remote control is going to need to be on Wi-Fi because I don't want to walk with my smartphone tethered to cable. Uh, if you want to do that, you could do that, I guess. I don't think there's a benefit. All right, uh, so breaking this down, any reasonably modern PC or Mac running like Windows 10 or Mac OS, oh, they're up to 10 now too, aren't they? Um, or if you're fancy, you can mess around with Linux things. Um, an Intel Core i3, i5, i7, that's kind of the power space that most applications are going to want to be. Some applications are lower sort of horsepower requirements. Um, so you can get by with something a little bit older. Um, like I said, for here, I'm using a Celeron and it's working okay. Um, i3 is probably optimal for streaming to a bunch of different rooms. You gotta have a smartphone, laptop, or tablet to control the thing that's on Wi-Fi and you've gotta have a deck. I think I've told you everything you need to go. You guys are dismissed. You've been a great crowd. Yep, we'll see you uh, next time. Um, yeah. Um, this thing I'm saying is you probably have the first two things. You probably don't have the last one. We'll talk about it later. You might not. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples now um, in case you wanted to like go out and buy stuff today um, that would just work. Um, again, you probably already have the computer and the smartphone, so I'm not going to tell you to buy those, but you need them. Um, and you need a network that's implied in all the streaming stuff. But my, te my tech Brooklyn Bridge streamer, it's about 3,000 bucks. Um, it's a pretty nice box. I've never heard, I've talked to a lot of people who own it. And I've never heard anybody complain. I don't personally own one, but um, it's a pretty simple device. It does have a phono stage. If, you, if you're of that persuasion, um, we can do that. Uh, it has a lot of other connectivity, um, but it's, it'll do Wi-Fi or Ethernet in and analog audio out. It's compatible with a bunch of different software, a bunch of different streaming services. Um, pretty straightforward device, uh, hard to go wrong with from what, from what I gather. Um, if you're a little bit fancier and you have a Mac, like a you know Mac Mini or whatever that you don't mind using that as your server, um, you can do that. You can control it with an Apple smartphone or Apple tablet. The Apple tablets are probably the nicest as far as remote controls of all the things that I've used. I'm not really a big Apple person, but uh, impressive uh, the way that they work, nice and smooth. And um, PS Audio DirectStream DAC with a network bridge. He's got this network bridge card that he shoved in the back of his DAC. He calls it a bridge. It's really a small computer that's on a card. It's about 900 bucks. It um, blind mates into the back of the thing and adds an ethernet port to the DAC um, and makes the DAC kind of a streamer. Um, pretty interesting idea. Um, I've got a couple of friends who have those, um, actually three or four, and they love it. Um, if you're more like me and you don't want to spend that much because, and I'll explain why I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to spend huge sums of this, on this stuff. Um, any PC or Mac, smartphone or tablet, and then this aloe box over here. This thing's, uh, if you don't buy it with all the fancy trimmings and power supply, it's only about 250 bucks. Um, it's pretty inexpensive. The power supply adds another 100 and something or whatever. And if you want the, if you go all out and get the SPDIF output as I have so that you can try out SPDIF DAX, 
all in it's around 600 bucks or so. So pretty inexpensive as far as the stuff goes. If you use it for, five, for three or four years and then it becomes obsolete, you're not gonna be heartbroken. If you use the MyTech or the PS Audio for three or four years and then you end up replacing it, I mean, it's, it depends on, I, a lot of people have a lot of money to spend on this stuff, but for me that would be uh, painful. <laughs> um, um, or if that's all too much and you just wanna kinda dip a toe into things, same thing for the server and the tablet. You're starting to see a pattern here, right? Um, but then you could just take a USB DAC and a little Raspberry Pi, or even there's, a, you know, there's even this Nano Pi, which is so small. It's like not much bigger than a quarter. So I did an event like a couple or three years ago at my house. Had a bunch of you guys over to build Raspberry Pi network uh, audio transports. Raise your hand if you were there. I see a few folks that were there. That was crazy, but it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So I did the event, mm -hmm. and then I actually put my Raspberry Pi into my system, Yeah. And but it didn't work with DSD files. Oh yeah, we'll talk about that. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Before you go on, yeah. um, I'm trying to get the sense, because I have a streaming, and all, I mean, I have a whole system that I'm very happy with, <clears throat> but I'm trying to get the sense of the signal path from the source, which might be Cobuzz or Tidal or Amazon now these days. Yeah and understand the signal path. So you got the source material, it's called Cobuzz, mm -hmm. and then does it go to the blue box first, or the black box first, and then to the preamp? Or it goes to the music work? server, to the network server, to the output device. So it's just something that's going into the music server. The path, the path is actually, it's a good question. I was gonna cover it later, but we'll skip it when I get there. The path is actually kind of hilarious, and we'll talk about signal path and, and, and why in digi the digital world, signal path is very different. So all of us had great audiophile mentors or we wouldn't be here, um, or we are great audiophile mentors, and then we try to explain the thing to other people, or we're just trying to figure this stuff out. But one of the things that we're always taught and we always try to respect is signal path. You'd like the signal path to be as short as possible. Everything that you add into that signal path is gonna add some kind of distortion or uh, you know, it's, it's the, the signal coming out of it, and especially in the analog world, is never gonna be exactly to the, like the you know, 10th nanovolt, the same as what came into it. So um, shorter signal path is almost always better. In the digital world, that's not true. That is not true. Um, in the digital world, a lot of times the longer signal path is better. Um, and that, well, I'll talk more about that later. I know that sounds insane, but um, just trust me on it for now and then we'll, we'll deal, deal, deal back in. Just to give you an idea of how silly the stuff is, um, I'm connected up with my smartphone over here because Wi-Fi uh, not working in this room. Um, that's over USB. So uh, when this, when my smartphone or my laptop or Larry's smartphone, because I put them on the Wi-Fi, um, when it asks this box to play a song, this box goes, okay, let me see if I can figure out where that song is. It's either on this little hard drive over here or it's on the internet over here. So it's gonna talk to, it's gonna look in its library and try to figure out where to pull that song down from. Um, and the library has some pointers in its database that tell it where to go. It'll grab from either one of those. Let's say it grabs it from the smartphone. So the signal goes from the smartphone to this little uh, home router. You probably have a router like a bigger one than this from your telecommunications provider, AT&T, Comcast, or whoever else. Um, and then it's gonna go into the switch, and the switch kind of learns where all the different other components in the network are. And so um, the, the, the switch enables those devices to talk, uh, and then the signal will go, let's suppose we're playing it out of here. It'll go into this box. Um, so the, the smartphone told this guy to tell this guy to play something from here. And then, and then the signal goes out of one of two digital outputs to a DAC and then to your system. Um, and that's probably one of the more simple paths that, uh, that signals can flow from this stuff. What software are you using to, to I'm, do that with? I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit as well. I promise. In fact, I'm gonna play something. Um, I'm gonna try to anyway, if my uh, network hasn't died yet. Looks like maybe it hasn't. And then we'll, um, we'll run through some questions as well. I got some questions. I, I, a lot of you filled out a survey and I really appreciate the, uh, the time that you took to do that. Gave me some great insight into kind of where everybody is. This is, a, as I suspected, a pretty sophisticated group of audiophiles as far as streaming goes, but there were still a lot of good questions and we'll kind of run through those really quickly. Um, and then I will play some music because um, this is an audio thing. And why, why the hell did we set all this stuff up if we aren't gonna play some music? So 
Uh, first thing, can we verify the provenance of music content supplied by streaming service? Can you do it with a record or a CD? Like this is complicated anyway. Um, one of the things that frustrated me and frustrates a lot of people um, in kind of the, in the download here is like, you go to HD tracks and you spend $30 for a high res thing. I did this, I bought I think an, a Cars album. I thought it would be great. Um, pulled it into Aud uh, Adobe Audition to do some analysis of what was there because I wasn't really crazy about the sound. Started talking to some other people about what I was seeing. It turned out that the file that I got had a specific mastering intent. So whenever you get a master from uh, a label that was mastered for a particular playback environment and a particular intent, this one was mastered for earbud listeners. It had pumped up bass, it had compressed dynamic range. It was a, it was a 24 192 album or 24 96, but it, the mastering intent wasn't for us. It was for somebody else. There was nothing in the kind of product information pre-purchase that I could have read to ascertain that information. Frustrating. This happens a lot. You get bad pressings of vinyl records. And it's, it, to some extent, um, whenever you see something that's been remastered, that's synonymous for like compressed for joggers or whatever. Um, so um, so that, that's, that's a frustrating thing. It doesn't go away with streaming. The nice thing about streaming, though, is that if you don't like it, you just go play something else. Um, a lot of times though people will get hung up, they'll be like, all right, I'm gonna compare this album on Tidal to this al the same album on Kobus, to the same album on my CD, to the same album that I downloaded over HD tracks to my vinyl record. And they should all sound the same. And if they don't, then well, I can, if I can stack rank these, then there obviously are some, there are some distribution methods are superior and some are inferior. You're probably not even listening to the same master. Um, this happened a lot with SACDs too. I've got some SACDs at home. The SACD layer is a completely different master. In some cases, even a different recording than the CD layer. And they're like, oh yeah, SACD is so much nicer. Sure. <laughs> anyway, so uh, bad news there. Uh, this, is, this doesn't get easier with streaming. Um, the nice thing is that instead of spending $30 for an album, you're paying 20 bucks a month to rent the entire library. And if you don't like that one, go someplace else. One of the things that's great though about being part of a club like this, especially now that you've got kind of an online connection as well, is that if you find an album that you really like, you can post about it. Everybody else can say, this album is really well recorded. I found something that's good. There's a lot of crap out there, but we can share with each other when we discover things that are really, really good. And um, provenance at that point is less important than does it actually affect me when I listen to it? Is it actually good quality music? Um, and I think that's the most valuable part of this whole thing. The sad thing about the streaming environment is license agreements shift and sometimes you find something that's great and then it disappears, you know, two years from now, it may not be around. Uh, so there's still a place for physical media, but I'm getting distracted. Ah, what are parts of Rune? What is Rune anyway? So somebody asked me, I think you did, what, what software I'm using today. I'm using software uh, called Rune. A lot of you've heard of it, a lot of you use it. Um, it um, came from, uh, Sulus, I think, I'm probably not saying it right, Sulus. out in the UK. Um, Meridian bought it. Um, it was like a $13,000 system or whatever, super fancy. Uh, not too long after Meridian bought it, the guys who wrote it and came up with it left and started their own company. Um, I think it was around 2015. They wanted to make uh, a kind of a, a, a piece of software that made exploring digital media and exploring music more like uh, physical media, more like kind of a tabloid type exploration, um, a more pleasurable experience. One of the things that we miss when we're streaming is a physical connection to the music that we're playing. There's not that album art that you can look at. Um, you're not able to kind of physically interact with what you're seeing. Everything's kind of squashed down to the size of your smartphone or whatever. Um, and even if you get a tablet, it's just a bigger version of what's on the smartphone. The quality is not very good. Um, the connection between artists and albums and learning about what the, uh, how the music was recorded, learning about like who is the bass guitar player on this particular album, can I find more albums like that, who did the mastering work for an album that I really love, those credits and being able to navigate those, most software kind of ignore all of that stuff. And then don't get me started on classical music, classical music most of these things are horrible for. It's a, it's a tough problem to solve, Rune I think has gone further than just, just about anybody. Um, so Rune, I, I started out a long time ago, a decade, well, more than a decade, a decade or two ago, doing this audio stuff, playing around with all kinds of different software, and I've landed at Rune. Um, I'll be surprised if I'm still using it five years from now because this landscape changes so fast. But uh, I, and I, I started about five years ago playing around with it, or whenever it started, yeah, about 2015, so pretty close to five years. 
Um, and I didn't think I'd be still using it now. So the fact that I am is a testament that it's really, really good. I tend to have very uh, high level of audio file ADHD with technology, music, and anything else. Um, it's treatable, but it's not curable. Um, right, so uh, what are the components of Rune and what do they mean? So core is kind of the server thing. I would think of it as kind of the server and the network put together, but you'll hear people talk about Rune core. What is core? Um, it turns out there, Rune has several different software components that you can download. Um, one of them is just sort of the desktop app that can do everything. Um, anything that can do everything usually sucks at everything that it does, and that's the case with Rune as well. When I first tried Rune, I compared it to JRiver, I compared it to Otterbonner. Sound quality was horrible, horrible. So I, 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 I fussed with it for about a year and I just gave up with it. I said, I'm, I'm done with this, it's not worth it. It's very pretty, the user experience is wonderful. Uh, sound quality was not there. And then I was talking to online to one of the guys who was the CTO at Rune um, about uh, an unrelated topic. And he said, well, you know, how are, you, how, are you, how are you using Rune in your setup? And I said, well, I tried it. It doesn't sound very good compared to other things. He said, well, how did you have it installed? And I said, well, I, I installed it on my laptop and then I connected a DAC and I put it on my headphones or put it on my system. And he said, well, that's not how you're supposed to do it. I was like, what? Um, so what you're supposed to do is put the core piece on a computer that's far away from your system, that has no DAC attached to it whatsoever. Um, and you're not supposed to really use the desktop, desktop, system, uh, desktop application as core at all. Rune has a couple of different other alternative ways to do that. There's something called Rune Server that just runs in the background on Windows or Linux or Mac. Um, it doesn't have any user interface at all. It just, like on Windows 10, it just starts up and just hides itself in the little system tray on the Okay, so you're right, my left, anyway, I'm over here. Um, it just hides there, it doesn't really do anything. And the only way that you can interact with it was by installing the control software on a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop or whatever. Um, and then outputs, outputs are easy. Those are kind of these things that have network cables coming into them and some kind of sound coming out of them. Controls are your phone or your tablet. It could be also a laptop that's running the desktop app. You can run the desktop app the way the Rune guys intended you to use it, which is just as a control, not actually as uh, server. Um, and then they came up with something that's kind of clever um, that uh, lets you display whatever you're playing. A lot of people like to have big picture of album art uh, somewhere in their house or like on a little tablet that's on a stand so that they can, you know, this is like you take a vinyl record and set it on a little stand so that people can see what's playing. They like to do the same thing with music. It turns out Rune has a way to do that as well. The difference between this and kind of any other software though is like a J River, for the most part, uh, there's some networky things you can do, but for the most part, when I see J River, people running J River, they have it on a laptop display or a desktop computer that's connected to a big display. They've got a DAC directly attached to it, and then a keyboard, maybe a wireless keyboard, or they've got like a 25 foot USB cable so that they can have the, DAC, the laptop sitting next to their chair while the, the digital audio goes across the room to a DAC on the other side. Um, it tends to be a monolithic type of system. The idea with Rune is we want to get music to every room of your house. Um, and we want the experience to be the same in all of those rooms. Yeah? J-River will do that. It will. No, no, it will. It's just gross. Have you done a comparison of the J-River server functionality with Rune? Yeah, the J-River is horrible. I used to love it. I was like, I, I don't know how many people bought J-River because I told them it was amazing. But the experience is awful. Yeah, go ahead. The ergonomics of it is awful. I think that you can get pretty good sound quality out of it. Um, like I said, initially, the sound quality that I experienced with Rune was far below what I was getting from J-River. And it was only because J-River and Rune are very different things. So Rune um, is very heavy on CPU and GPU on the core and the remotes. And so if you have a DAC connected to those things, you're gonna get bad sound. If you do the same with J-River, you get pretty okay sound because J-River do doesn't push the hardware that hard, yeah. Heavy draw that you say is occurring in Rune. When I play Rune and I've seen this complaints on the the, the, uh, the community, yeah. I get a lot of dropouts. I mean, I'm playing a song. I was doing it today, yeah. and I'm in the middle of the song, and all of a sudden, boom, it stops playing, and then just jumps to the next song. Maybe something. Yeah, we'll talk about that too. We'll talk about that too. Is that is that have to do with my hardware capacity, or is it something about Rune? It's yeah. It's your network, it's your network. So, uh, I'll, I'll actually, I don't know if I'll get to that, so I can't promise. If you play, if you're familiar with Audio Varna or some of these other applications, they'll download, and JRiver I think does the same, they'll download the entire track into memory. 
Um, and so as long as your, ne your network can be kind of choppy, like maybe it goes really fast and then stops, and really fast and then stops, and really fast and then stops. That's terrible for streaming audio, but JRiver and Audio Varna get around that problem by filling up a big buffer, like many megabytes. Um, they'll download the entire song. There's some streaming software that'll download an entire album, even if you're just gonna play like five minutes of it or two minutes of it. Um, so they'll pull all that stuff into memory so that you don't have that problem. Rune's philosophy, because they're you're streaming to so many different environments. There may be just different DSP requ environment requirements for each room. Um, they're not going to stream the entire album down. They just stream down what they need. There's a buffer, but it's, it's small. What they found is that bursty downloads like that um, will create spikes and noise that can affect the sound quality. And so having a nice steady stream is gonna produce better sound quality than something that's bursty. The problem is, um, if your network environment is not able to keep up with a nice steady you know, progress, then you're gonna be in trouble. So well, there's, a different, there's a big difference between bandwidth and latency on networks. You could have like, you know, the fastest like a you know, gigabit per second network, but if it stops and, stops and starts, stops and starts, or if the latency is really long, so like by the time you ask for something to the time you get the first byte is like you know, a second or two, um, you're gonna have a bad experience with something that's a dedicated streamer. How do you, how do you prevent that, I guess, would be the question. So remember before I said plug those cables in? That's number one. Almost every time that I've had somebody complain about that, the problem has been because of Wi-Fi. Almost every time. Uh, there are, can be other things that are going on too. Networking is a complicated, fiddly thing, uh, and I can't get into all the details here. But buy good networking gear, or buy insanely good networking gear, um, or get somebody to kind of help. There could be, you might have networking cable that's running through your house that's right next to like a high voltage power line that goes to your five high voltage power connection that goes to your dryer or to your air conditioner. And every time the air conditioner comes on, it you know, spikes noise into your network and you're not able to keep up. There are a lot of things that could cause that. I am way ridiculously over time. So uh, I am still gonna play a song because um, I said I would and I don't want you to be disappointed. Um, there's a lot of, I'm gonna stream something because this is a streaming presentation. And this is risky because it, it might not work. <laughs> I'm streaming this over a cell phone connection that's very far from home over a USB cable into a, a, a piece of crap travel router. Um, so uh, bear with me, if it doesn't work, we'll just talk some more. <laughs> It'll be just like home. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody hear that back there? <laughs> <laughs> 